So we've already covered this in lab and some on the class on Wednesday. But remember, IR, first of all, what part of the electromagnetic spectrum uses IR? The infrared, the IR part. I have asked that question before and I've received some interesting answers where people overthink it. Same thing with UV viz. Whereas NMR uses what part of the spectrum? Radio frequency, the radio part, radio waves. Okay, and remember, this is just the fact that molecules will bend and stretch differently based off of what they're connected to. And there are all the different possibilities on the ways that they bend and they stretch. And we've already um, discussed this somewhat in the different ways. It always makes me think of the, well, actually, it's beyond you, before your time, so never mind. I was going to say the old Sally O'Malley sketch from um, Saturday Night Live, which if you ever do that, he talks about her Easy Rider pants. But maybe you ought to Google at some point in time on YouTube. They're pretty funny. Which talks about bending and stretching. Okay. <clears throat> and so you can either do this either symmetrically or asymmetrically. You can also bend in and out of the plane. And so I will never ask you so to describe scissoring versus wagging and all that kind of stuff. You know, that's just, just to let you know that there are different, different functionalities with that. And you can imagine a double, something that's a double bond is going to bend or stretch differently than something that's a single bond. Or, or an oxygen is going to behave differently than a nitrogen or a carbon and so on and so forth. Do not sit there and memorize all of the numbers. I just want you to, to recognize the presence of alcohols or carboxylic acids because they're very unique. Remember, they have that big, broad, they call it the peak or signal, you know, the little part that hangs down well past the 3,000 marks on the wave numbers. Okay, which brings me on to this point. Instead of using parts per million, they use wave numbers and the units are inverse centimeters. <clears throat> okay, so you don't have to worry about an inverse second, of course. Is, what is, does anyone know what's a common term? People usually call them per seconds or inverse seconds. What's the other term that's usually called? It's less scary sounding. You never say 250 mega inverse seconds. It's a hertz, right? And so, well, they don't do that with a wave number, it's in inverse centimeters. Okay. So there, then, there are two parts to the, well, two broad functionalities. And this kind of really overplays it, I think, to where they, they are correct. This is the portion of the spectrum that's important for looking at functional groups. But if you've had forensic science with me or if you looked at forensic science, this region right here is actually also really important. It is the fingerprint region. And so it's unique for every chemical. So it's one way to also compare a standard versus your sample. But this is the important region for just looking, trying to figure out does it have an alcohol, an amine, an amide, an alkene, so on and so forth. Okay, that's why that there's, you know, they're just talking about that in this portion. Once again, you don't need to know an exact cutoff point, but just realize, you know, roughly 1500 or less, This the right hand portion of the spectrum is called the fingerprint. All of this is called the, you know, for the functional groups. And you see that characteristic, and we'll look at some of these in a moment, but whenever it looks like this, over here in that far end, around 3200 or so, that's significant for alcohols and or carboxylic acids. Okay, so just look at some examples. This is hexane, so we can see here we see this portion, which would be the fingerprint portion. And then we see the traditional CH uh, stretching. Don't memorize this, but I just want you to be able to tell that this one, for example, does not have an alcohol in it because we don't see that round, broad signal at this end. But if you compared hexane to hexane, you'd see that there's a very difference. There's a big difference. I'm going to pause this right here. So okay. <laughs> much to be able to think. Or if I gave you a table and said, you know, what part of this would be, which one would be more indicative of hexene versus hexane, then you should be able to use that table and say, oh, this part, these numbers, these peaks, you know, make more sense for hexene versus hexane. But just by eyeballing it, you should always recognize the alcohol. 
Okay, so there's benzene. Oh, and there's alcohol. <laughs> so that's why I've been pointing it out as we went along with this broad, um, roughly around 3200, but this broad peak here, the stretching that we see there, that's indicative of an alcohol. Okay, so there we go. And so, which I don't think this one, I did put hexanol and hexane next to each other, but it's really easy to tell the difference because of the fact that hexanol, the alcohol, has that broad um, peak, for lack of a better word. And so, whereas water, which really is just an HOH, if you remember from the water signal, maybe it looks something like this almost, because it's almost all is that big old alcohol stretch. And so... It's just indicative of the OH stretching. Okay, I uh, don't need to memorize nitriles or anything like that, all right? But other than if I gave you, once again, numbers and I asked you to match, the, based off of the table, to match the functional group to the respective, um, you know, spectrum, then I would expect that. But I only want you to know, to understand where that alcohol and recognize the alcohol um, bond stretching occurs. Okay. Kind of table that I would be talking about. If I gave you a table like this, and then I asked you which one correlates to, you know, acetonitrile, then I would expect you, and I'd give you the formula for acetonitrile since you don't know what nitrile is yet, um, I would expect you to be able to put two and two together. Okay.